Let's, as we come to God's word this morning, let's bow together in a word of prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, we do thank you for the privilege we have to know you. Singing that last song, we were indeed reminded that we, on our own, are indeed as vile as that thief upon the cross. That we have no righteousness of our own. That indeed, our sin mounts up to the heavens. And if you were to account iniquities, there is no one that could stand before you. But Father, it is in light of that that we are so grateful for the gospel. For the good news that Jesus Christ came to save us from that mountain of iniquities. From the wrath that we deserved from your hand for our rebellion. Father, I pray that you would cause the truth of that gospel, the good news of what Jesus did on our behalf to sink deeper into our hearts that we might treasure him more, we might live more for his glory. Even this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the story is told about a town that lived upon a river and it just so happened that the government in that region concluded that what would be best for the region was that a dam would be built upon that river. But by building that dam, it would cause that village, that town, to be submerged under a lake. This, of course, has happened all over the world, all over our nation, where dams are needed to be built. But because of the certain certainty of the watery grave of that town, and because it was, it was coming, the people began to essentially give up on their community. Even though the dam would not be built for a few years yet, they stopped making repairs upon the town. And the town began to show signs of decay. People stopped fixing things that were broken. Nothing received a new coat of paint because in their minds there was no point in repairing anything. It was all going to be destroyed anyhow. This is what can happen when people lose hope for the future. They cease investing in the present. And this can happen in on an individual level as well as a corporate level. People lose hope for the future and so they stop investing in the here and now. They stop investing for the future to come. And this can happen in the church as well. Those who know the name of Jesus and yet they fail to have hope for the future. They fail to, uh, to have any hope for the days ahead. But we need to, be, need to be reminded that as believers in Christ, we have been born again to a living hope, 1 Peter chapter 1 says. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's because Jesus lives that we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for us. We are confident that all things will turn out for good in the end. We're confident because this inheritance includes a kingdom which Christ will bring to this earth. We have been washed in the blood of Jesus. We have been sanctified by his grace. And therefore, we will inherit that kingdom as a gift. We know that in the end, Jesus wins. Amen? Amen. We live our lives in Christ with hope because of the resurrection. We know how it will end. And we can show our hope by investing our time, our talents, and our treasure into that which will live far beyond us. Now, there are several things that will live beyond us, that will go past our lifetimes. But there are two things that I want to draw our attention to today, and that is our children and our buildings, or 
our progeny and our property. Today, I want to challenge us to look at stewarding both of these with hope, with hope. Here at Foothill, we have begun two initiatives that I'm excited to tell you about today, and we've already announced these at our members' meeting, but uh, I'm here for the first time speaking about it publicly. The first initiative is the remodeling of our worship center, the, the building that we are in here right now. And the second is the starting of a hybrid Christian homeschool. I'll explain both of these in more detail as we go along. But as I said, our property and our progeny, our buildings and our children, both require investment of time and money and require faith as we look to the future. Now, in putting buildings and children side by side, let me just say at the outset that both are not equal, okay? We all know which one is much more important, eternally more important than the other, but they each have their place and we can invest in both because we have hope for the future. And so looking at stewarding both of these, let's begin by looking at, first of all, Christian stewardship of church buildings. Christian stewardship of church buildings. Now, in my comments on the subject today, I borrowed heavily from a helpful article by Pastor John Henderson from Arkansas. He wrote an article on, on this, and I thought his articulation was biblical and wise, and, and I'm, which is why I'm leaning upon that today. And so it's a question that we maybe don't think about that often. How should we think about church buildings? How should we think about the structures that we meet in? And I think we should begin by describing two perspectives that must be avoided. And these are unbiblical perspectives on church buildings, unbiblical perspectives. And Henderson here writes, first of all, we should avoid glorying in our buildings. Glorying in our buildings. This is a form of materialism. And if you've been with us through the book of Luke, we've touched on materialism several times where Jesus warns us about not putting our hope in our treasure, not putting our glory in the physical possessions that we have. And this is what can unfortunately happen in our church structures as well. This happens where we, when we measure our church health by our building size. Or we measure the Lord's faithfulness, faithfulness to us by the quality of our buildings. Or we boast in our buildings before others. Or we find encouragement for gospel ministry simply from our buildings and the size of them. So one ditch is glorying in our buildings, a form of materialism. The other ditch that we don't want to fall into is despising our buildings or a form of asceticism. This is where we measure our spiritual maturity by how happy we are with our dilapidated buildings. Or we boast in our old facilities. Or we equate physical renovations and construction with worldliness. Or wrongly accuse God of judging churches who improve their facilities. These are the two ditches, that, two unbiblical perspectives that we should not have as it, we approach <coughs> thinking about church buildings. And it's easy to flip-flop between these two perspectives. One minute we're, we think we deserve a great facility, the next, next minute we downplay their importance to only focus on ministry and people. And so what we need to know here at Foothill is how to walk down the middle road, a biblical road, and to think biblically about church buildings. And that's where our second point is, to think biblically about the existence of church buildings. And to do this, I'm going to give you five statements regarding a biblical framework of church buildings. The first statement I'll give you is God has used physical places to accomplish his work. If we look to scripture to see, well, how does God's work of plan of salvation relate to physical places? We see that God has used the physical world. He, just, he created the physical world in Genesis 1 and 2. And he made it good, as the text of, uh, of creation says. And so the physical world can glorify God. It's not inherently evil, nor should it be escaped. And as we read through the pages of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, we see that the physical world was indeed the stage, the place where God worked out his plan of salvation. This is where he uh, carried out his redemption plan. Let me just name a few places to jog your memory. 
the Garden of Eden, Mount Ararat where the ark rested, the promised land of Canaan, Jerusalem, the temple. Or we might think of the incarnation where the Son of God took on physical flesh. And we think of the new heavens and the new earth, a place that will be recreated but still with physicality. As we can see, the physical world was used by God for His redemptive purposes. And yet, the physical places where these redemptive events took place was not the primary focus. And so this leads us to our second point, that number two, what happens in the physical place is, not the, uh, is the essential thing. What happens at that physical place is the essential thing. What was the significance of the temple? It was because God's presence was there. What was the significant, significance of Golgotha? It was because the Son of God was crucified there. What takes place at those physical places it was, is what gives those places significance. God uses physical church buildings to accomplish His work, but it's the work of ministry which takes place at and in those buildings that is essential. And so, when it comes to church, it's important to remember, number three, that the church is a people, not a building. The church is a people, not a building. The word church means called out ones, the Greek word ekklesia. It refers to a group of people who have been called out, chosen by God, united to His Son, and sanctified by His Spirit. Christian people throughout all history make up what is called the universal church. These are those who have been saved through all of time in all places. But Christians united together locally make up what we call the local church. And so therefore, when we talk about Foothill Bible Church, we're not talking about this campus, we're not talking about this structure that we're meeting in right now, we're talking about the people, the people who have come together, covenanted together. We meet on this campus and in this building, and for that we're thankful, but the church is the people. And that's why, if you were to take away our building, we would still be the church. We would still be a church and could fully function as one. Sure, it may be difficult, but it could happen, and that's because the church is a people, not a building. But the fourth statement we can make regarding the existence of church buildings is that number four, our primary work is spiritual, not physical. Our primary work is spiritual, not physical. This isn't to say that the church is not, it has no involvement in physical care or needs. It's just to say that our primary, our most essential work is spiritual work. We gather to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. We preach God's word to see spiritual transformation take place. We want to see believers edified and built up spiritually. We want to see unbelievers converted to Jesus. We want to see the name of Christ glorified. And this is all primarily spiritual work. Friends, Jesus commissioned us in Matthew 28 to do what? To make disciples. He didn't commission us to build buildings. And so we can say... As our fifth statement, fifth and final, is that buildings are helpful, not essential. Buildings are helpful, not essential. We do not need church buildings, but indeed they are helpful. The work of the church can happen without a building. We can worship God, we can edify the saints, we can evangelize the lost without physical structures, and yet they are helpful for helping ministry to go forward. And they're helpful in several ways. They're helpful, number one, as a place to assemble together. It's helpful, a place to assemble together. This enables us to all come under one roof into one room. From all our stations in life, from all of our vocations, and we can gather together in one place. Rather than spread out into smaller gatherings, we can come together as one and lift up our voices in song and in worship. We can also steward our, our resources well. We can have one music team to prepare and lead us all in singing. We can have one preacher prepare the Word of God and deliver it to all of us. And we can pool our resources to pay one set of utility bills. But a second uh, way that buildings are helpful is that it can help minimize distractions. Again, we can meet outside without buildings, but we would be uh, working against the, the weather, whether that be rain or hot sun. Uh, the changes in temperature and so it's helpful to be in a place where there is a climate control where we can be protected from the elements 
And we can sit comfortably and hear God's word undistracted. Also, without noise distractions. In our case, we've got Cable Airport not too far from here, and uh, we get some loud airplanes overhead. There'd be some uh, hard competition with a, uh, with a World War II uh, plane flying overhead. So, they help us minimize distractions. Buildings also provide a place to make disciples. Again, the church building is the only place to make disciples, but we, because we scatter out in the world to do that, but this is a campus where people can come and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and be able to know how it is that they can be saved in Him. But it's also a place for us to mature disciples. This is where the saints can come and be edified. They hear the word of God and they're built up. They're strengthened in their faith and they're encouraged to head out and to continue to live for Him. And it enables a place for believers to gather, for us to see one another face to face. And to encourage one another. It enables us, the teachers of the Bible, teachers of God's word, to come and teach the church. It enables our children to come and be taught the word as well. It's also a place for us to multiply disciples. Multiply disciples. It is here at our buildings where we can train men and women for ministry. We can multiply the ministry by equipping the saints to be ministers of God's word. For example, our facility here has been used since last fall to open up our training center a year ago with 28 guys. And almost two months ago, many of you participated in our parenting conference that took place right here in this room. Training and equipping for ministry is able to happen through our buildings. But finally, buildings are helpful as a place to display Christ. Because we have a building and a campus, people can walk in. Strangers can come in. It's a place on the map. They can drive by and see and inquire. They can see and hear the church, be in the church together because we have a place to gather in one accord. And though the church is a people and not a building, we show ourselves to be the church when we gather together in worship and service and care for one another. And in this, we show the world that we are Christ's disciples by our love for one another. And so with that as our theological framework and background for how we should think biblically about buildings, I want to get practical and talk about our buildings here. And so that's just the third uh, point here is stewarding the buildings of Foothill Bible Church. How can we steward the buildings that we have here? The structures on this campus were built by prior generations of believers who attended Foothill Baptist Church during the 60s, 70s, and 80s. They gave of their time, talent, and treasure to see that there was a permanent gospel witness here on 15th Street. It's encouraging for me to look back and see pictures where this was simply lemon groves and there were believers there with the shovels in the ground behind a sign that says, future site of the time Foothill Baptist Church. Believers believing that a work of God could be started here, and here we are many years later. Foothill Baptist merged with Upland Bible to form Foothill Bible as we are today in 1993. Soon after that merger, our church invested some funds to be able to renovate the room that we are in. And since that time, we've sought to keep it as well-maintained and cleaned and repaired to the best of our ability. However, over time, this building has begun to show its age and use. So the elders believe that now is the time to begin to look at doing a renovation upon this building. And the members will know that we have been looking at aspects of our whole campus But upon reflection, upon feedback and careful prayer, we are recognizing the need to focus on this building, this uh, this room really, this building uh, from the, the, the stage forward out through the foyer. And to do that modestly, we recognize the unique times that we're in and particularly in the economic situation with rising inflation and cost of building materials and all the rest and we want to do this wisely. And so we want to focus on 
updating this room out to the foyer and the restrooms and all of this in the name of seeking to steward the buildings that God has given us here. This building, particularly this room, gets used every week of the year. It's our primary gathering space. And we love the tr wonderful traditional elements that are found here. We want to continue to maximize those. The high ceilings, the natural light. But there are some things that could use some updating as well. The carpet in places is beyond repair, especially on the stage, which maybe you don't see as much uh, from, from your view. But the pews are also tired. Some of you may be sitting in one of those tired sections of the pews right now. And aspects of the restrooms have not been changed since they were built in the 70s. And if we're able, we'd also like to be able to see more of uh, this room better utilized for even more seating capacity if the Lord wills. Now we are in conversations with an architect now. We've received some initial drawings. We're going back and forth. We've, uh, we've also, again, as I mentioned, brought this before the membership. We received feedback from them. We've also pulled in, uh, elicited the specific input of several knowledgeable uh, individuals within the congregation who have given us valuable feedback. And again, we are looking at modest repairs to this room in God's timing. And even though these things like carpet and paint and, and simple things like that may sound like simple repairs of the room this size, nothing is cheap and it all adds up. And so this is going to take all of us giving to make this a reality and to see that we would steward this building for generations to come. Again, as I mentioned, we don't want to enter into this unwisely or foolishly. And so my petition at this point is simply for, for you to pray with us. We're in the beginning stages of outlining exactly what this renovation might look like. And so we're just asking that you would pray along with us as elders of what God's will would be. First, I encourage you to pray thanking God for the facilities that he's given us for this campus. They were built through the gifts of God's people and by God's grace, all of our buildings are paid off. We are not in debt for any of them. And so we praise God for that. But we pray asking that if it be God's will for us to invest in this campus and in this building in particular, that he would make that clear that we'd spend the monies here in the near future. We pray also that if it is God's will for us to do this, that he would provide the funds. As his word says, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he can make it happen if it is his will. I also ask you to pray that God would preserve our unity in the midst of this. It is often at anything related to building, anything related to even color, in churches, that there can be great strife that arises. And we pray that God would keep our eyes set upon the gospel of Christ, unified around him, and that we would be able to walk in unity together as we seek to do what is best in stewarding this place. And finally, let's just pray that God would continue to use this campus as a gospel lighthouse in this community. That you would continue to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and salvation that's found in his name and that we would be able to steward this place well for generations to come. Now we will have more specific information in the days ahead. We wanted to just bring everyone up to speed and wanted you to be informed so that you could pray about what your involvement might be. If God moves to give in your heart in the near future, we do have a fund that is already set up to be able to receive such donations but our primary thing that we're asking for at this point is simply that we would pray together for God's wisdom, direction, and provision. So, the first way that we can build for the future, for what would outlive us with hope, is first to steward our buildings well. But the second aspect, and I want to switch this morning to think about stewarding our children well. Let's move to that which is most important or more important even than 
our buildings. Again, we're talking about buildings for the future, looking ahead to what goes beyond us. Now, I don't believe that you need to be told that there's a battle going on for the hearts and minds of our children right now. And in one sense, it's always been going on. The battle between light and darkness, between the Lord and his enemy, Satan, and his demons has always been going on since Genesis chapter 3. But particularly in our nation, over the last century, there have been those who have been seeking particularly to reach our children in such a way that they would like to separate children from the religious values and beliefs of their parents. This has been a stated goal. They've been trying to produce a secular America, believing that the way for us to be unified as a nation is if everyone really leaves their religious commitments and comes into a neutral public square. We'll talk about whether there's actually such a thing as a neutral public square in, the, in, in moments ahead, but in many ways, there has been success on their front in trying to produce what they have envisioned. But Christians of each generation must push back against such an effort. We must do all that we can to direct our children in the way of the Lord. We don't pawn off the raising of our children to other people, much less to others who don't know the Lord. It requires diligence, perseverance, and conviction. But we cannot give up. For the sake of our children's souls, for the sake of the glory of Jesus, we must give ourselves the task of parenting Christianly. And to that end, I want to remind us of three biblical truths regarding the stewardship of our children. We talked about stewarding our buildings. Let's look at the thing now. What does the Bible say about how we are to steward our children and steward them well? The first truth we need to be reminded of is that children are gifts from God. Children are gifts from God. And the Scripture explicitly teaches this. Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5, say this. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Friends, children are not a biological accident. They are explicit gifts from God. And we who know the Lord should know that and treasure them more because of it. But the second truth, biblical truth to be reminded of is that parents are responsible for their children. Parents are responsible for their children. Who does God give, give children to? It's to parents, right? This is seen not only in Scripture but also in nature, biologically. Children are the fruit of the union and therefore, it is those parents who are responsible, responsible for the well-being of their children. Now, contrary to some ungodly theories, they are not the property of the state, least to parents to care for them for a while. No, they are given to the parents by God to be raised responsibly. Now, of course, in the brokenness of our world, there are times when this is not possible. And it's, but it's clear that that is meant to be the exception, not the rule. From God's word and from nature itself, God designed the family as he gave children to parents. But the third, and this is where I want to spend our remainder of our time this morning, the third uh, aspect of stewarding our children well that we need to be reminded of this morning is that parents must disciple their children. Parents must disciple their children. And for this, I want you to turn to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Mm -hmm. 
We were in this book just last week as we uh, were gathered for our Thanksgiving service. Here again for a different purpose. But again, just a reminder that this book was written by Moses to the people of Israel as they were there in the plains of Moab, ready to cross the Jordan River and go into the promised land. Because of Moses' sin, he was not able to enter the land with the children of Israel. He remained on that eastern side of the Jordan, ended up dying there, and the people of Israel went, entered in the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. And so here we have Moses, the great patriarchal leader of Israel, giving in the book of Deuteronomy his farewell sermons as he seeks to exhort the people of Israel to live faithfully to the Lord. And here... In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we are given some instructions that particularly relate to parents. Read with me, starting, or follow along with me as I read in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. From these verses... I want to show you four priorities for parents. Four priorities for parents. The first priority for us as parents, as we seek to steward our children well from the Lord, is, I would say from verse 4, is that you must know God personally. You must know God personally. Look at the declaration of who God is in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The task of parenting Christianly begins with knowing who the Lord is. Not just some general idea about God, but specifically knowing who the Lord is as revealed in His Word. Too many of those who claim to be Christians and Christian parents have some sort of general idea about God, but when you ask them on any specific points of doctrine or theology, who is this God? The articulation is quite slim. And so as parents, we must continually seek to clarify our doctrine. Because friends, think about this. If our view of God is fuzzy and unclear, what, it, what is it that our children are going to have? What kind of view of God are our children going to have? We've got to have a clear picture and portrait of who the Lord is if, it is, if we want to pass that on to our children. And so I ask you this morning, do you know this Lord? Do you know our God? The Lord our God who is one. He is the only true God. Revealed as we put together from all of Scripture, He is one in essence, but three in persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the God that we worship. That is the God that we follow and serve. Not some sort of generic monotheistic God, but the triune three in one. That is the Christian God. That is the only true God. Everything else is false gods. And we've got to be crystal clear on that as parents. Do you truly know the God of the Bible? Have you come to a saving knowledge of Him? Have you come to Him in the name of Jesus Christ, His Son? Have you repented of your rebellion against him? Recognizing that it is your sin that stands against him, the holy creator. And that it is only Jesus and through his blood and sacrifice upon the cross that is able to remove that sin and that penalty of sin. Have you truly come to know him in a saving way? The opportunity to know him is always open and always available if we would but humble our hearts and turn to him in faith. 
So from verse 4, I'd say our, our first priority for parents is to know God personally. But the second priority of parents we see in this passage in verse 5 is that you must love God holistically. You must love God holistically. Look at what the instruction is in verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Moses instructs Israel to love their God. This command is also then picked up in the New Testament. Jesus repeated it as the greatest commandment. This is a big deal. If Jesus, the Son of God, comes and tells us this is the greatest commandment, then we better take heed and pay attention. Now, the word love here does not just refer to some sort of fuzzy feeling in our hearts, but it combines this idea of affection as well as commitment. Affection and commitment together. You could, I like the word devoted. We're to be devoted to God. There's a commitment to Him that is to define our lives and that should also manifest itself in white-hot affection because there's no one else more valuable. There's no one else more worthy of our love and our devotion than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this idea of devotion and being committed to the Lord with affection is played out, I believe, in these qualifying phrases that come after the command. He says, you shall love the Lord your God, and then he says, with, and there's three with phrases. First, he says, with all your heart, with all your heart. This refers to the most inner part of our being. The heart in the Hebrew worldview was understanding to be the center part of our being, the part that made our decisions, the control center of us. This is where our, our, our emotions, our affections come from. This is where our decisions come from. This is where everything that drives us, our strong desires, come from our hearts. And so, Moses is saying that we must be committed at the deepest part of us. That we love the Lord, our God. That we're devoted to Him. That our lives belong to Him. And that we treasure nothing more. But secondly, he says, with all your soul. With all your soul. Now, in our understanding, we think of the soul as kind of that immaterial part of us. We've got our bodies and we've got our souls. But I believe this is probably better understanding as the totality of our being. Soul is sometimes referred to as, as, as our existence or our being. And so I think you could think of this as the whole person. This means that our bodies and all that we are are to be oriented to the Lord, are to be oriented towards our devotion to God. In other words, friends, there's no part of us that we keep for ourselves. Every inch of us belongs to the Lord and is to be devoted to Him and Him alone. We must be wholly and completely surrendered to Jesus. And finally, Moses says that we are to love the Lord with all your might. With all your might. Again, he doesn't allow any square inch to go untouched. With all of our activity, with all of our motion, with all that we are and all that we do, we are to show our love to the Lord. This refers to our activities. This refers to our actions, our plans, our vocations. What we do in this life, whether we're a computer engineer or whether we're a stay-at-home mom, whether we are a student or we're an elected official or something else, no matter what we are or what we do, we are to show that we are devoted to Christ in how we do those things. We live to show that Christ is our greatest treasure. We don't live to show that we love us more than anything else. We show to live that we love Jesus more than anything else. Of course, we ask ourselves as parents, do we love God this way? This, this totally, this completely? Do we give a model to our children of what it means to be devoted to the Lord in this wholehearted, holistic sort of way? And friends, this is where, if you're even remotely honest, you'll raise your hand and say, I fall short. We all do. I feel it every day. And so where is our hope when the standard is so high? Our hope is found in Christ alone. 
who saved us, who redeemed us, and who equips us by his spirit to enable us to, to accomplish what he calls us to. And so, as we see what God calls us to, we want to rise to and not slump off and go, well, no one can attain that, so I won't even try. No, we say, Lord, I want to, I want to love you in this way. I want to give my life to you. I want to show that you are the most valuable thing to me. Help me to live this way. Show me the ways that I'm, that I'm showing myself to be more valuable. Show me the ways where I'm loving myself more than loving you. We need to continue to surrender ourselves to him and ask that he would work in us because he's promised his spirit to be able to do that. So these first two priorities for parents turns and looks on ourselves, doesn't it? We've got to do a gut check with our own hearts. This isn't just tips and tricks for how do we fix the kids, change the kids, control the kids. This is about looking at our own hearts and lives first because, friends, we are the ones doing the parenting. If there's not quality internally, how can we expect quality to manifest itself externally? We must ask to God radically, we must ask God to radically transform our hearts so that he would radically transform our parenting. And so that leads us into the third priority for parents that we see in this passage. And that's in verse six. And that is, you must treasure God's word intimately. You must treasure God's word intimately. Again, the, the, the spectacles of this passage have not yet turned to our children. They're still looking at us. Look at verse 6. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. They're not just to be on our minds. They're not just to be in our pockets. They're not just to be in our libraries. The word of God is to be upon, what does it say? Our hearts. The Bible, God's word, is not just to be a book on the shelf, a book in our hands, but it to be a treasure on our hearts. And so I ask you, what is your relationship to God's word? Would you say you treasure his word? Would you say you love it because it is the words of the living God? Because you love him, you thus want to treasure the words that he's spoken? Friends, we've got to look at our own hearts. Are we truly treasuring the Word of God? Or has reading the Bible and hearing the Bible preached and listening to the Bible all turned into perfunctory duty? Is it really upon our hearts? Oh, sure, it might be in our heads, but do our children know that we don't just know the Bible, but we treasure it? We cannot pass on to our children what we ourselves do not have. And so, that leads us then to the final priority for parents that we see in verse 7 through 9. And that is, you must teach God's word diligently. You must teach God's word diligently. Look in verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, and you bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now here's the thing I want you to see here, friends, that this is not to be just a hobby or a pastime. He says you are to teach them diligently. This is to be your primary occupation. This is to engage your every day. Friends, if you have children, your task of instructing them the ways of the Lord. Notice the way that Moses describes the ways the parents are to do this when you rise, when you sit down, when you lie down, all over the place. In other words, the point is, is that Moses says in order for us to pass on these words to our children, the child's world must be surrounded and encompassed by God's word. Everywhere the child turns, the word of God is being brought up. Wherever they go, they should hear and see the word. And so I believe that from these verses, we get an instruction that as Christian parents, we are to so teach our children a biblical worldview that understands that God's word is the foundation and basis for how we see all of life. And so as we rise and as we go and as we go about our days and we're going out in the midst of this world, we 
our teaching from God's Word, helping our children to see God's uh, world through God's Word. This is what a biblical worldview means, is that we see all of life through the lens of His Word. We've already saw in verse 5 that all of life is surrendered to the Lord, our most inner part of us, our whole being, and all that we do. And here, verses 7 through 9, describes that all aspects of a child's life he's to be confronted and instructed from God's Word. Now why is it? Why is it that children should be bumping into God's Word everywhere they go? It's because the goal in Christian parenting is to raise our children to know and love the Lord with all their heart and with all their soul and with all their might. In other words, we want them to follow in our footsteps and obey the commands that we were just given in the verses previous. We've got deeper spiritual goals than our unbelieving neighbors. We aren't short-sighted shooting only for financial success. We aren't shooting to the low bar of being upstanding citizens or simply academically successful or simply that they would be nice people. We want children who love the Lord like we do, do we not? That is what we are aiming for. And that's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. There's a discipline and instruction that parents are to give to their children, and it's all of the Lord. Now, why does Paul exhort fathers here? Why doesn't he say parents? I believe it's because, biblically, fathers are the head of the household that the responsibility lies first and foremost with them. It doesn't mean that they do it all, but they're responsible for it all. And so Paul exhorts the fathers to make sure this is taking place in their home. And so fathers, I'd exhort you to take the leadership in instructing and raising your children. You must humbly lead them to love the Lord with all that they are. And in particular, there are three main areas of a child's life to consider. As we think about giving them a biblical worldview, as we think about raising them in an atmosphere, in an environment of God's Word, a child's life is mainly composed of home, church, and school. At home, fathers, you can lead in family worship during the week. As you gather the children around the Word of God, and it's very simply seeking to read the Bible to pray together and to sing, sing hymns, sing worship to the Lord. Very simple. And yet, many of us may not have grown up in a home that did that, and so we feel unprepared knowing how to do that, and there's lots of helps that are out there. If you're interested in knowing how to get on track with helping to lead in family worship, we've got plenty of resources we can point you to. But I encourage you to make the effort. We can also fulfill these priorities that we see here in Deuteronomy by bringing our children to church. Bring our, bringing our children to church. Now there are many families who think that simply bringing their family to church, bringing the kids there and dropping them off is going to somehow make them Christian or somehow point them in the right direction, make them good people. But just bringing them here is not just the point. Like, oh, they're here, I'm good, we're done. But we are seeking to help them to be followers of Christ, right? Right? Which means we don't just want them to attend and show up at church and then punch the clock and then they're done and they're out. We want them to love the bride of Christ. The church is Christ's bride and we want our children to equally love the bride of Christ. And so we model that in how we love the church and our excitement to come and to be with the saints. They learn to worship. They learn to love the church as they watch us. More is caught than taught. And let me just take this opportunity to encourage you fathers to bring your children here at the 9 a.m. hour, the equipping hour for your children. For most of the year, we take a break in the summer, a few weeks off around the holidays. But for most of the year, we've got classes for children that will reinforce what you're seeking to do at home. It's not a replacement for what you're doing at home, but it reinforces what you're doing at home. To teach them the Word of God, to put the songs of God in their hearts, for them to sing in their hearts as they go, and for them to learn doctrine as they seek to know the God that they live and the God that created them. 
There are gifted and qualified teachers that are there every single week. Praise God for them who teach our children the Word of God. And unfortunately, there are many that miss out on that opportunity because they're not taking advantage of that hour. And so I encourage you, this is the Lord's Day. Sunday is the Lord's Day. Bring your children, plan to be here through the morning. Come, be instructed in God's Word, and have your children be instructed. Find other times for family time, but make Sunday morning the Lord's Day and time to be at, uh, with His people. Build this habit into your children now when they're young, and it will serve them the rest of their lives. Now, finally, parents have responsibility over children's education. Now, too often, again, we talk about the home, we talk about the church, now we're talking about the school. Too often, Christian parents have believed that education is value neutral or is religion free. It's not. If you think about the Bible, there's only two categories. It's either believing or it's unbelieving. There's no uh, uh, non-believing gray area. You either are for the Lord or you're not. As Christian parents, we are called to instruct our children in a Christian worldview, to see all of life as under the Lordship of Christ. This means that all areas of knowledge, math, science, history, language, are not outside his domain. Every area of knowledge is submitted to him as Lord. Now, all parents, no matter what schooling option they choose, whether public, private, or homeschooling, teaching their children a biblical worldview is not optional. This is what we have see, sought to see from Deuteronomy chapter 6, is to teach their children the Word of God is a mandatory task of all Christian parents. And if you hear nothing else, that is what I want to impress upon you this morning. Now, I'm not here to tell you what schooling option you should choose, whether public, private, or homeschooling. My goal is bigger than that. I want to impress upon you the biblical mandate to teach your children to live their lives under the lordship of Jesus Christ and to live out of love for him as we're instructed in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, it's possible to accomplish these goals in all educational settings. The mode of education is not mandated by Scripture. The mandate is to teach our children the Scriptures and a Christian worldview. And so there is freedom in Christ for each family to make the best decision for their children. However, practically speaking, for many they have found as they sought to teach a biblical worldview while partnering with the public school system has become increasingly difficult. From the ideology driving the curriculum to the peer environments on the campuses, it's become more difficult. And so many parents are wanting to give their children an education that is based upon the, the Bible, putting their children, uh, that is based upon the Bible, and as they start to put their children maybe in a private school, the cost can be prohibitive for many. And the option of homeschool can be daunting. And so many parents are left wondering what to do. It's because of that that as elders we sense that the time is right for us to launch a school that will help meet the needs of Christian families within our church and community. And so next fall, we will be launching Foothill Christian Academy here on this campus. It will be a hybrid homeschool model school. By a hybrid homeschool, it means that students will come to campus for a few days a week to receive instruction in a classroom from qualified teachers and then will be home the other days of the week completing coursework sent home by those teachers. Our prayer is that through this model, we'll be able to help parents provide a robust, academically rigorous education that is based entirely on a biblical worldview. It will be less expensive than a private school and will provide more assistance than a home school. And so, if you are interested in this, I want to have you mark your calendars for January, January 10th, January 10th in 2023 at 6.30 p.m. We're going to have an informational meeting in which you can learn all different uh, information about what the school will be and entail. 
Know that this is not our expectation that every single Foothill family would be a part of this. We are simply seeking to offer this for those that it would be helpful to, that it would serve those in helping families and coming alongside and partnering with families as they seek to educate their children. And so in addition to this, we'd ask you to pray. Even if you will not be participating in this school, we encourage you to please pray. We want this endeavor to honor Christ, to serve his people. We pray that all these details come together and that God would bless all of our efforts as we seek to disciple our children here at Foto Bible Church. The children that God has placed here in our families and in our church are a stewardship that we want to steward well unto his glory. We want to invest in them as we seek to invest in the future of our church and of the world. And so friends, we live with hope for the future. We live with hope and we can invest in those things that will outlive us as we seek to live for the glory of Christ. And I pray that we at Foot of Bible Church would be so rooted in Christ and in the hope of his resurrection that we would be able to smile upon the future and invest accordingly. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the reminders from your word this morning that we indeed have a living hope in Jesus Christ, that we are able to look with joy upon the future, smile upon the future, knowing that you are with us, that you are planning out the days ahead of us. Father, we thank you for the children that you have given to us, and we ask that you'd please help us to steward them well. I pray for each individual family, each parent, as they seek to discern what is wise and what is best for their children, Father, as they seek to obey your word in this day, in this secular age. Would you give them strength, give them wisdom, give them courage to continue to press on each and every day and follow your word? And Father, I pray that you would help us to steward the resources that we have, including the buildings that we're in here. And we pray, God, that you would give us wisdom for the days ahead. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you that you have redeemed us. And we give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.